Um, so for Jamaica Bay, I know that a lot of you work very um, closely with Jamaica Bay. Actually, since we have a small group, do you mind um, introducing yourselves? I'm looking at this side of the room. Who is from the waterfront line? Lauren, who's the National Park Conservation Association. Pamela, Lisa from the American Literal Society. Don Reapy, American Literal Society. Alyssa Store, American Literal Society. We're stacking them on. Delmar D. Dave Kuciniak, City of Smith. Hey, Dan. Bob Albright, Hayes Anderson. Karen Alyssa D. Um, so since we're a smaller group this evening, I think you should feel free to ask questions about the presentation. We'd really like for this um, experience to be a dialogue between the agency and the communities that are very passionate about protecting water quality in Jamaica Bay. Um, in terms of the historical context of the day, we know that it's one of the ecological jewels of the city. Um, and over the years, as, as uh, a lot of urbanization and um, impervious area has been added, we've seen a loss of a lot of the original tidal wetlands. And while we'll talk about some of the projects that we have in place to um, improve the ecology of the bay, the real focus of tonight is the issue of combined sewer overflow. Um, so for those of you, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this topic, but we'll just highlight it. Um, on a day like today, all of the wastewater that's generated from our homes and our schools every time we shower or flush the toilet is sent to the wastewater treatment plant for treatment. Um, but many of areas of, of the city are served by what we call combined sewers. Um, and so that's where wastewater and stormwater runoff during rain events are actually put into the same pipe and sent to the wastewater treatment plant for treatment. Um, but depending on the type of rain event or the duration of rain, sometimes that mixture, that combined sewer uh, mixture, overflows into our local waterways. Um, and it's obviously an issue that DEP has worked to address over the years. We invested billions of dollars to reduce CSOs and improve water quality, but we recognize that there's still work to be done. Um, so in terms of how rainfall impacts CSOs, not every rainfall causes a CSO event in Jamaica Bay. Um, on the average of 100 rainfall events per year, about 40% of them can trigger CSOs in Jamaica Bay. Um, so, so we can go to the next one. Um, so in terms of why we're here this evening, hold on a second. In, the ter in terms of why we're here this evening, uh, the city has an agreement or a consent order with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation um, to look at the impact of CSOs on water quality. Um, and that agreement requires us to submit what are called long-term control plans, or LTCPs, which are essentially plans of strategies to reduce CSOs, um, to look at the impact of uh, CSOs on water quality, and to potentially um, identify projects and alternatives that could be implemented to address CSOs. So uh, we are submitting about 11 LTCPs. We've submitted six or seven so far. Um, and the one that we're here to talk about tonight, obviously, is Jamaica Bay. So this is our kickoff meeting for this long-term control plan. Um, so the LTC pro LTCP process is long. It's due to the state next June, June 30th, 2017. Um, and so today we'll be presenting about our existing information for the Bay, the data collection and analysis that we've done We'll talk a little bit about the process for modeling and how we identify different alternatives and projects. Um, and then we'll come back in the spring and we'll have another presentation where we'll talk about different alternatives and options for uh, reducing the impact of CSOs um, on water quality. And then we'll have a final meeting um, sometime after the LTCP has been submitted. Um, so are there any questions so far? Yeah. 
Just, just the naked in the woods, am I wrong? So, excuse me, Lewis. The woods, Gary, take the right side check. Um, <laughs> anytime anybody's talking to me about averages these days, I get nerdy about it and upset because averages in the past will mean nothing because I believe all those averages will go out the window with climate change. Mm -hmm. And what was 40%? Before, or probably be about 60% or something, some very, very bad things that could happen more often than that. Mm -hmm. you're, ta you're talking about the percentage of rain events that trigger CSOs. Yeah, I think that's a, it's an important point, and we'll talk a little bit about the modeling that we do looking at past rain events um, and future rain projections as it goes into the analysis for. Um, so with that, we're expecting to have Keith Mahoney from our staff here to present. Fortunately, he's stuck in traffic on bandwidth. Um, so Lily Lee, who's also from our Bureau of Wastewater Treatment, will come in and uh, pitch hit for him for a little bit. Thanks, Lily. Good evening, everyone. So just uh, an overview here of the Jamaica Bay drainage area, all the colors over here. So in Jamaica Bay, there's quite a uh, few number of tributaries, but the ones that we are concerned with are, um, there are six of them that we're concerned with, and they are Paddock Basin, Fresh Creek, Henry Creek, Spring Creek, Bergen Basin, and Thurston Basin. In this area, um, there, it, um, the sewers drain to four ways for treatment plants. There, there's um, Jamaica, 26 Ford, Rockway, Coney Island. And along with those wastewater treatment plants, there's also CSO outfalls. There's about 20 of them, and uh, 149 almost 4 outfalls. They're a bit hard to see here, but you will be able to see them a little bit later in terms of our maps later on when we put them. We also have two existing CSO facilities, um, one at Spring Creek and another one um, at Pavigas. Yeah. Uh, recent one. Um, so the total acreage drainage area of this area draining to um, Jamaica Bay is 52,000 acres, 52,200 acres, and 31% um, of this area is served by a combined sewer, which is the area in orange. The area in green is separate sewers, and areas in red are direct drainage, meaning that they don't have the flow into the um, tributary of the bay. And there's no AA battery in it. Where's the on? Where's the on switch? Um, classification and uh, water quality standards is for the bay itself. It's uh, class SB, which means it's um, suitable for bathing, or uh, primary and secondary contact, which is uh, primary contact. Is right, and where, 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 where's, where's the double battery? Yeah. For recreational fishing and recreation such as boating. Um, where the tributaries are um, classified as class I. Okay. Uh, that's suitable for secondary contact. So we have the specific uh, standards in place for the different uh, classifications okay. for class SP and class I, for dissolved oxygen, there's classifications for dissolved oxygen, fecal coliform, and total coliform. Uh, the fecal coliform and total coliform standards are based on new rulemaking that was promulgated by DEC in late 2015. And they're actually the same for class SP and class I. Um, the goal is to uh, reach for primary um, contact classification standards. And also, another goal is that EPA has recommended um, future recreational water quality criteria using um, the entire compass as a um, parameter for a, a standard parameter. So in order to do the work that we needed to do for the LCCP, we had an extensive uh, sampling and monitoring program. Um, the LCCP team went out during um, late 2015 from October to November and um, did some uh, uh, Sampling. But we also have existing, uh, HSM is Harbor Survey Monitoring, where um, it's a dedicated crew from DEP that goes around all New York City and has been gathering data for quite a while since um, what is it, the yeah. early 1900s. Is it? Yeah. I think so. And then we also have a central monitoring group that, um, whose uh, purpose is to look for illicit discharges. So um, those are the parameters that they, each of the shipping sampling programs gather data on. 
so we have this CSO LTCP sampling. Uh, in addition to um, the receiving work itself, they also did targeted sampling at six CSO locations, um, which was ended up doing uh, for uh, nine weather events and the, the Pico and Terrell and YSI parameter, which includes the self oxygen temperature from conductivity and sound salinity. Um, they also had um, done uh, flow monitoring earlier at five locations and continuously monitored um, the flow going to the CSO locations. Um, we need that data in order to um, calculate how much of a load is uh, So these are the land site flow monitoring locations. Um, you'll see that they're mostly around, uh, these are, um, the, the locations are on, um, I guess you could say, uh, the most, some of the more important discharge points at the head of the tributaries. And then this is a, kind of an overview of all the sampling that um, the, the uh, typical sampling that has been going on other than LCCP specialized sampling, but the, um, you know, the usual, the regular sampling that we've been doing. So on the northern shore, we have seven locations. Uh, Inner Bay, there are um, five locations in total, and the Rockaway Shore, there's uh, nine locations in total, and these are done by the Harbor Southern Marketing and Central Now we also have a uh, sampling at the tributaries itself, and uh, LTCP, especially since that's what we're um, really concentrated on, um, did quite a uh, few sampling. Um, they did it at Thurston, Thurston Basin, Burger Basin, and Fresh Creek. And uh, we'll go into a little bit in the next slide why we select those uh, tributaries to uh, sample. So this is a, kind of a, almost like a weather map similar to weather map where it's color coded and um, the legend at the bottom is for um, for example the orange color is uh, for Pico color form of a geometric mean of uh, 501 to 1000 colonies per 100 millimeters and you can see um, one the one this is during dry weather so um, you can see that urban basin had uh, some there now we go to what other um, where um, we know some of the tributaries are influenced by the so overflows, you see more of an impact to those tributaries. And of course, we also um, looked at Intero because it's the upcoming standard. Um, and this uh, is compatible with what we're seeing in uh, the um, Puerto Rico and Bergen Basin. And this is the wet weather. And we also took a look at um, the cell oxygen and the bay itself. Um, to, uh, to, uh, we can see a few uh, concentrations of about uh, Good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Mahoney with the New York City DEP. I'll be um, discussing some of the uh, water quality programs and studies. Uh, this one's just an overview. Again, everyone's familiar with the show of Jamaica Bay. There's a lot of ongoing programs. This is a quick one, so there's probably much more than this. There's a lot of different stakeholders involved. In terms of 
in New York City, one of the bigger programs is the Biological Nitrogen Removal Program, in which we're upgrading all four treatment plants for um, spectrum biological nutrient removal. The plant that you're making for instance for that just have recently been completed. Um, the biggest thing is very good nitrogen removal. Going down the right way, you'll plan to be upgrading in the near future. And we're projecting a, about a 50 to 60 percent reduction in nitrogen discharges from based on conditions. There's also um, the watershed restoration pilot studies. Uh, we have the bivalve and wilderness restoration. We have the algae and sea lettuce harvesting, uh, salt marshes, and beach habitats. And uh, marsh island and radiation attenuation study. Uh, we also have, um, as the three mentioned, post construction water quality monitoring and ecological study ongoing right now. And again, that's just looking at, based on all the nice reductions in the past, what, what does the water quality look like now? What's the ecological benefit of the benthic community, marshland? So who are we looking at all the indicated ecological health of the water quality in front? There's um, a number of completed and still planned marshland restoration projects to restore the um, degrading marshlands. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers is involved in a resiliency planning in which they're going to look at um, putting in tidal barriers at the inlet of Rockway, and inlet of the Rockway Inlet, as well as around the Rockway that can get future uh, bed by sandy. And there's also the Jamaica Bay Science and Resiliency Institute, which kind of encompasses all these programs. They're taking the lead, and they, they're probably, I think, probably the programs really combining all these ongoing efforts into one comprehensive effort. So in terms of the Combined Sewer Overflow Program, that's really the focus of tonight. Uh, this is just listing some of the uh, projects that have been completed or are in construction right now in Jamaica Bay. We have the biggest one, the Paddy CSO Facility Basin, a 50 million gallon storage tank that's online. Uh, we've actually been in Paddy recently at the, um, I, think, I think it's the Hudson River boat club that moved there, odd location, but and they were talking about the improvements really They've seen vast improvements in how you're facing since this facility came online, so that's been a big success story. Uh, some of the other projects, small ones, um, automation at uh, one of the regulated the J2, works for Spring Creek. We have upgraded Spring Creek storage facility. This facility predates the Clean Water Act. It was online before 1972. It's a 20 million gallon CSO facility at the head end of Spring Creek. Uh, we had some other projects such as sewer cleaning in the 26 ward area. Uh, we had Henry Creek dredging at the head end. Uh, regulator improvements at J3, J6, and J14 recently completed. This is putting bending weirs to help uh, divert more wet weather flow to the plane to reduce CSOs. Uh, another piece of that is a new 48 inch parallel sewer that um, helps convey more flow to the Jamaica treatment plant. We have um, ongoing right now, we have a 26 ward wet weather stabilization project in which we're making improvements of headwards and putting in some additional primary settling tanks. And we also have the uh, Fresh Creek 26 ward high level sewer separation in which we're going to um, take out stormwater, take stormwater and instead of going to the combined system, we separate it and have stormwater discharge to reduce the CSO discharge in the Fresh Creek. This just gets into some of the bigger projects. This is just the an aerial of the uh, Spring Creek facility. Again, upgraded in 2007, constructed before 1972, um, has a 3,200 acre drainage area, and it's in the um, 26 ward drainage area. So when flow is stored here at 20 million gallons after a wet weather event, it's pumped back to the 26 ward treatment plant. And there's also an ongoing disinfection pilot study that just started this June, which we're assessing the effectiveness of hypochlorite disinfection for CSOs and trying to look at other impacts in terms of um, chlor potential chlorine toxicity as well as the overall pathogen kills for fecal coliform and terrors. That's ongoing. This is um, just a di um, picture and a schematic of the Hattigan Basin CSO facility. And this is a newer one. It uh, went online in 2011, about $400 million cost, a 50 million gallon facility. And uh, this plant's in the Coney Island drainage area. So once the wet weather subsides, the, uh, wet, the flow stored is pumped back to the Coney Island treatment plant. And again, as I mentioned, had significant improvement in the water quality in the Patagon Basin, not only the, um, qual the qualitative and numeric standards, the numeric standards are also qualitatively in terms of floatables, oils, and other things. 
Uh, this is just an interim, interim flow control, which we had in a few of the basins, Ferragesha, Bergen, and Thurston. Again, this is just the, um, basically a baffle at the end of the CSO discharge. After a wet, wet weather event, we'll come with the skimmable to clean up, clean up the floatables attributable to the CSO.
And um, so those are the three agencies that we have very closely working with. And so far, this is our status and conclusion of the day. This is one of our success stories. This is um, which we had done in uh, junior high school 2018 with the um, Trust for Public Land. Um, this is a nonprofit organization we partner with. They provide stormwater management, green structure funding, and then they do a fundraising for the other other playground. So the end point is we start something like this and then we end something like that. <laughs> but you know you cannot be the right mostly under the turf fields here, but you see the transition from quite a different story where we started. So this is these are the type of projects which we believe the next reality of the green infrastructure in the city of Columbus in those three different um, public partnerships, including the trust for public And um, I'm here also to talk about, okay, you might ask, okay, you are doing everything great. You are capturing the pri uh, public property. But what about the private property? You know, 50% of the, the land in the city in the right-of-way part is in private property. So, so we said, okay, how can we really bring this meaning in private property, especially in Jamaica Bay and Southeastern Queens and other places? So we first started with this grant program. It has been going on. I think we had the workshop yesterday um, that we would like to bring more people into our grant program. We are already acknowledging there are some aspects of it that doesn't really work well with everyone. Um, so currently, you know, we, we identified 33 projects and we constructed 14 of them, so a little bit more than that. And there is a little bit more in the pipeline. It has been a slow start, it hasn't really picked up yet because of those issues in terms of the, um, the covenant issue or some ordinance of the mortgage issues, which we are using capital funds that we cannot let go. But we said, okay, this is not really picking up, it's been hard to really pick up. So we said we really need to shift our thinking, maybe how we can bring the private property owners to the table and encourage them, you know, this is a good thing for your property. It's gonna increase your property value, also it's gonna help the city to achieve its own water management goals. And in the future, you mentioned climate change. So we said, okay, it, it's a win-win both for the city and for the private property owner. So we kicked off this new private incentive program, which we are partnering with in RDC, which, um, what is that? National Resource, National Resource Defense yes. Council. That um, we are, who, can the, who have done private incentivizing projects in other parts of the country, such as Philadelphia, and we said, okay, please come to the table and bring the best of the best to the table and help us how we can do what other cities are doing. How can we really bring the private property owners to the table, make the funding available to them and help them out to build green infrastructure. So we just put out an RFI on Monday. It's RFI means request for information. And we are asking the nonprofits community organizations and engineering companies or whoever is interested to bring their ideas to the table to help us to build this new GI program. And once we get all those ideas, we are going to come up with a proposal that um, is going to be implemented in order to really move this thinking from public property to private property. So if anybody interested in that, I can be available to answer a couple more questions along the way. And then the other two things that we did was 2012 stormwater rule. This is like, this is our carriage approach, this is our stick approach. <laughs> so we are saying private property owners who redevelop new development projects, because that's the time when you can really incorporate green infrastructure, when we are redoing the building. That's what we think is very expensive. And we said, okay, that's the time when development community is making money Maybe they should also help us to be able to do the stormwater management. So we passed the rules in 2012 that really makes the redevelopment, redevelopment projects to be able to detain and help our stormwater goals. And then last but not the least, um, we had the green tax abatement. 
which has been on the books for three plus more years now, but we haven't had many takers. It's um, been out there. We are encouraging again new development, um, construction, the owners to be able to take the advantage of the tax abatement rule, which we are paying for the green room um, with the 523 per square foot. So that's it from my part, and I'm glad to answer any questions you have now, or if you want to wait. say a little bit more about for the RFI for the private incentive program. Sure. Um, um, what what kind of ideas and what are you envisioning about that? So I think um, the idea is really, you know, are we thinking for um, public property, property retrofitting? We know what to do, right? Like we know where to go, we know what kind of tools available that we can implement. We have done a lot of work since 2012 up until now to find out what works the best. But when it comes to private property, we really don't know. Like in terms of how, what is the contracting structure? How can we pass the money from a public agency to the private owner? So, so the idea of the RFI was to get a third party administrator that is gonna do that for the city. Meaning that, you know, I mean, most of the thing where you are very fall short in the public program, finding those partners, as I said, the night shops, schools, the, the park property, you have to have partners to work with you. Currently, the private property owners, I mean, we cannot knock each and every door and say, if you want to sign up, I mean, we don't have enough resources. This is, this is the group we have. <laughs> so what we are asking under the RFI we said we would like to target 1,000 acres the next 15 to 20 years. So that's the goal, right? We are, it's not uh, a non achievable goal, I hope. It's the goal, because everybody wants a goal. What is my target? And the next thing we are asking, there's a lot of questions we are asking, but the first, of, the first is how can you build this program as a third party? So we are asking a third party administrator to show us that how are they gonna market, how are they gonna bring the customers. We would like them to target in EJ communities, the low income communities, and bring the neighborhood um, communities into the mix to help us to build. And we are asking them how you are gonna do the construction and construction management process. Because so far, as I said, in the last four years, we developed really nice designs. Like we have those templates for a bioswell, for a rain garden, for a potential green room. You know, we, we know the tools in the GI box that we have to design. So we are not asking the third party to design it, but we are asking, we are going to give you the tools that you need to construct it. So, so what they need to bring to get is, how are they going to bring private property owners to the table? How are they going to really make the construction happen on the property and how are they going to inspect if it's constructed per the standards that we are providing them. And make sure that during the contract term, those green infrastructure is maintained because it's easy to build it and then leave it alone and these are biological systems, they really need attention, like you know, like you, you don't leave your plants without water throughout the summer, so it's the same idea that we want them to take an ownership of this program, bring the right people onto the table, and implement the green infrastructure expeditiously on private property. Do you have an idea of how much funding you would put up for that program, and are you going to target specific areas? Within we have announced, yes, absolutely. So what we did, and we kind of shifted our thinking because we, although we are here today to talk about the combined fever overflows to Jamaica Bay, we all acknowledge that there are more discharges going into the same receiving water body besides the combined sewer overflows. Like um, Keith and Lily talked about stormwater discharges going into the same water body. So the water body doesn't care about where the pollutants are coming from. So 
So we said, okay, we really need <coughs> from the idea is we need to improve the load reduction coming from both systems. So this program is targeting the priority water bodies in the city, including CSO and separate stormwater. So, you know, we don't want the third party to be on a block, which is a combined sewer area, and the next block is a separate sewer area. He said, look at it as a big picture, go bring the private property owners in those water, whether it's the watershed drainage areas, regardless of where they are, CSO or MSO. I'll uh, just go back and take another look at the nature of green. Uh, are you intending to put permeable pavements on their blacktop and parking lots? And if so, who's going to pay for this? So that, that's a great question. The nature property, that's one of the, the things that they are asking us. The parking lots is a problem. You know, the service is already gone, where um, they take the the biggest improvement for the property, for the natural property, is the parking lot. So we are not really saying you cannot do here versus here. We are saying everything is open. It could be a rain garden, or it could be a permanent payment, or a subsurface parking lot restaurant. And the DEP, once we identify those sites that we believe are in our priority water bodies, which are going to really improve the water quality, then we pay it all. We pay for design construction, and also we are putting a new contract out there to maintain those green infrastructure on Niger property. And the biggest area uh, when you look at Niger is parking in their parking. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think you know one thing that really helped us to bring Niger, and I want to highlight that, was Sandy, <laughs> because after and it's not a good thing to happen. But what, uh, what happened after Sandy, some of the nitro properties get flooded. And that really brought to nitro management and the leadership saying that we cannot keep doing what we had done in the past. You really need to convert those impervious areas to pervious areas. And they approached us when they are doing this recovery, because nitro received um, a lot of federal funding in addition to the city funding to be able to rebuild some of those properties. We are now teaming up with them particularly for those sand affected sites to be able to see which one of those really in the situation. When they are redeveloping because of the flooding, we are bringing GI, where we know that there's going to be some water volume. Please, I'm sorry. Go. No, please. Uh, is um, there going to be an outreach to the residents of those houses? Absolutely. Or more more Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we, we are working with the property managers at NYCHA properties. And we are, uh, when we do the walkthroughs, we engage the property managers and we get the, I think Mikhail is one of our key people who help us with the NYCHA resident outreach to um, to be able to, and you know, one of the ideas that we always like trying to be outside of the box is how can we use the youth in those properties to be able to help us maintain because, you know, it's, it's those green infrastructure needs maintenance. If not, like you can build it and leave it and come back 50 years later, it's still functioning. So I think maintenance is the next big thing in our mind in terms of how we are going to maintain these green assets throughout the city and where we can really find the young people who can take ownership on their property. We want to bring them to the city. This is sort of a two-part, or actually one is a request, the other one's a question. And the request is if we can spend a little bit, we get a chance to spend a little bit more time in depth on talking about the uh, green infrastructure grant program. Because I was at your workshop, uh, your green infrastructure grant workshop yesterday. We, your folks did an excellent job, and uh, certainly it's a good program. I'm sure that uh, you, uh, that the folks here would like to know more about that because maybe they represent different nonprofits that have different projects that are uh, in the area of green infrastructure. And number two, uh, uh, Senator Ovella, State Senator Ovella, some of his residents and his constituents have uh, people over there. You've seen some of the articles in the, I think it's the Queen's Chronicle where they, are, where they don't want to have bioswales in the area. So again, that just touches on with what you're threatening for up a moment ago. How do you feel 
what, what is what would we do to address that in order, in order to encourage people to talk to them of who are in opposition towards bio swales? That's a great question. I'm going to actually refer to Mikhail on the second one, and then I'll go and pick up the first one. But if you want to add an example, please. Uh, sure. Um, so yes, we're we're very aware that Senator Avella um, and uh, other elected officials in the areas of Bayside and Northeast Queens have a lot of concerns and questions about bad swills. Um, so we're actually having a community meeting with them on Monday night. All of the civic associations and local neighborhood associations will be joining us um, so that we can fully talk them through the process. Um, I think that we are still very early on in the design stage there. So as we, as teams were walking through and folks were saying, hey, what's this team doing? Why are they marking things they spray paint on my sidewalk? Um, there were a lot of questions early on, even though we are not as far along in the process as we normally are when we start our community engagement. Um, so that presentation is really gonna talk them through the whole thing and sort of clear up some of the misconceptions about the rain gardens and bioswales that we've seen in articles like the Queen's Chronicle and some others. So for instance, um, the Queen's Chronicle said that bioswales remove parking. Well, that's actually not the case. We don't remove parking when we build them. Um, so we think that there's some misconceptions in the community and we're really looking forward to having the opportunity to clear those up, talking about um, our outreach and engagement strategies. Um, another example is that Pinar mentioned that we have a very robust maintenance program for the biosoils as well. We have crews that are online maintaining our constructed biosoils in the foods as well. Um, but on our website, we have information about stewardship and how to get involved in caring for biosoils if you're interested. Um, and some folks read that and interpreted it as we're forcing homeowners to maintain them. So that's not the case. We're actually not putting any um, imposition on the homeowners to maintain them. We look at them as city infrastructure that we maintain as much as we maintain you know, catch basins and other DEP infrastructure. So clearing up those misconceptions and um, hopefully uh, talking about the benefits of green infrastructure, not only on water quality in terms of uh, reducing CSOs, but also improving neighborhoods with greening, air quality, urban heat island reduction. We're really hoping to see more buy-in and support after that meeting. Just, yeah, the, the tone, my, my take on the tone of some of those articles is it's a maintenance-related issue. Agreed, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that, that um, in a lot of neighborhoods with, where single-family homeowners um, have a very a, a strong sense of ownership of their of the sidewalk that abuts their home, of potentially the grass patch that um, is in the sidewalk before the street, um, and so some of those questions about you know who owns the sidewalk, the city owns the sidewalk, but the homeowners are responsible for um, they have sanitation obligations, and so there's that quasi ownership can cause a lot of confusion. So I, I think that once we're able to clarify those questions, we'll um, see more support for the program. Um, I think we, I, I want to propose to get back to the grant question because I think um, Stephen needs time. It's my first slide. <laughs> he's not going to talk to me, but I'll promise after he's done, you'll come back and give us a little bit of information on the <laughs> This gets back into some of the LTCP modeling and the alternative development. Right now, it's interesting in green infrastructure, unfortunately. So I'll go through this pretty quick. Uh, confusing slide here. This just basically shows the two models that we use. So Lily talked about all the um, sampling we did. We did CSO flow monitoring in five locations. We did satellite flyover and the land side getting impervious data. And so all this information we take from the land side, we put the sewer systems into the model, which you can kind of see up there. We take all this information to calibrate the models. That's the first step of this program. So first we calibrate the land side models. The next step is then the water quality models. We have all the ambient sampling. We have the model survey. As Lily mentioned, I think they started like 1904. 
we also go out there as part of the LTCP, we chase wet weather events. That's what we're more interested in terms of the uh, pathogen modeling. So these two models that we calibrate are then used to um, for the alternative evaluation. So we rely on these calibrated models. Uh, these models also have different assumptions that we need to put in them. So some of the assumptions, such as the land side model, again, I talked about um, all the calibration. We have gauge-adjusted radar rainfall that we use to calibrate these models. The satellite flyover I mentioned, the water quality model I mentioned with this calibration. Then it goes into the um, assumptions going into the model. So these are out, supposed to be projections out of 2040. So we use 2040 sanitary flow and loads. Uh, we include all the committed CSO and DNL projects. So I mentioned all the CSO projects that are constructed or underway. So these are all going to be included in the baseline as well as our committed green infrastructure. That's all in the baseline. We then, um, for our analysis, we selected the 2008 JFK rainfall, which we consider to be more representative of a typical wet weather event. It ends up being about 75th percentile, so we try to adjust for climate change at all. It's supposed to be a median event, it's more 75th percentile, so we think that's representative of future conditions. And uh, for the baseline and for the selected alternative, we also then run a 10 year scenario, particularly for the pathogen, where we select 2000, I think that should be 2002 to 2011. So we take 10 years of data, and the 2011 happens, happens to be a very wet year, so we have a real wide range of events. So it's really representing what's going to happen over the 10 years. With that, we project the CSO volume for 10 years, as well as the corresponding water quality. So that's all included in our alternative analysis that we use to select the final recommended plan. Uh, this is just kind of a simplistic thing of kind of things we evaluate. Green infrastructure we talked about. Again, that's usually in our baseline assumption. We have green infrastructure, but we do look at that as an alternative. But we also have to look at other alternatives where we approach 100% CSO capture. So the arrow on, the, um, on my left, your right, kind of just shows the increasing complexity, increasing cost. So again, source control could be sewer modifications, but it could be green infrastructure, system optimization. Again, it could be additional sewage, regulator modifications into the collection system. As we start increasing, we really talk more about treatment and storage. So talk about large storage tank, large treatment, retention treatment basins, and ultimately large storage tunnels to really capture these. Because we're talking, I mean, you can get into um, 150, 100 million gallon structures of larger when you start talking about this 100% capture. And the other issue with this, when you capture that flow, you need somewhere to treat it. So, the plants have a certain capacity, so in some cases the plant may not be able to handle these large volumes. You have to build a separate treatment facility. These are all things we look at in the toolbox. Now this is another way to show the toolbox in terms of increasing cost and complexity. Again, this is just more details on the analysis. Again, source control is kind of the low-hanging fruit that we try to get as long as um, optimizing the sewer system. And as you get further down, you really get more into storage and treatment, and that's where the big costs are to get out there tunnels and things like that. And that went pretty quick. Uh, any questions? Or we can just save everything for the very end. What kind of disinfection? Uh, right now, we've been looking at other things. Right now, we're mainly looking at hypochlorite. We're also looking at using sodium bisulfite for dechlorination. That's our focus right now. We look at things like parasitic acid. Uh, it wasn't, the performance wasn't as good as we expected. That one we like because it would only be one chemical to handle instead of two. UV, we've been considering, but a lot of the tests we saw the UV hasn't been too successful on CSO, just because it's just the quality, how dirty it is, the turbidity. Typically, if you do UV, you really need uh, some sort of like a chemical treatment ahead of the UV. So primarily looking at the cheaper, like hypochlorite with sodium bisulfite dechlorination. You know that a lot of the nonprofits are very, very concerned about the release into the veins. Yes, I know we had a lot of, that's why doing uh, the Spring Creek pilot study, we're also doing a lot of bench scale studies in terms of that, and that's why, I mean, dechlorination is also a serious consideration. So if we do chlorination, if we need dechlorination, we'll do that to make sure we don't have the chlorine toxicity. So at this point, we're going to break out into our breakout sessions. Uh, we have four. The first one is with Pinar, and it's on the topic of affordability. So if you're interested in um, our water rates, how we pay for products like these, she'll be able to talk to that. 
um, the mat will be in this first corner right here. The second one will be over here with Lily, where she'll be talking more about CSO control and the toolbox uh, that Keith mentioned. Um, I will be in that back corner uh, talking about MS4 and the Green Infrastructure Program, and Keith will be in the far left corner talking more about Jamaica Bay, specifically where the water quality sampling was done and answering questions there. Um, so if you want to pick your area, be, feel free to ask a lot of questions about different topics, and then we'll close out shortly after. Oh, we said we'd come back to the Green Infrastructure Grant <laughs> Program. Sorry about that. Sure. So yes, the grant program um, provides up to 100% of design and construction costs for projects that manage one inch of stormwater runoff. Uh, so it's a project, it's a program that has 31 active projects, green roofs, rain gardens, permeable pavement installations. I think that the smallest grant is $35,000. The largest is about $1.2 million. Um, and so the program itself has been very effective at targeting large properties. And uh, it's a better fit for larger properties because of the type of funding that is used to pay for it. Uh, we're looking for properties that are not going anywhere because they have to sign a 20-year restrictive covenant uh, in order to receive the funding. Um, as you mentioned, there was a workshop yesterday. There will be more workshops throughout this year and into next year, and there's a lot of information on our website as well. Who are the grantees? Um, it's a pretty big range. There are um, sort of local organizations like Lenox Hill Neighborhood <coughs> House in Manhattan or the Osborne Association, which is a nonprofit for folks transitioning out of the criminal justice system in the Bronx. Um, there's some universities, Queens College, Pratt Institute, New School. Um, again, because of that 20 year restrictive covenant, which says the green infrastructure asset has to stay in place and function as designed, it, uh, the better fit properties have been ones that are in their neighborhood and in their for a long time. Um, that the biggest projects, there's the rooftop farm at the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, and a very large parking lot uh, retrofit with the Bronx Loop. So. Um, but again, if everyone wants to stand, head towards the back, pick your area, um, and we'll have about 20 to 25 minutes to answer questions, more questions. Where are you going to be looking at in terms of the actual water in 
make the bet for 2020. Do you have to talk to that? So I'm going to hit that to Kinar, actually. I mean, I'm quite me if I'm wrong, Keith, but the, one of the earlier slides clearly showed you the standards, which I think you are right. What is our goal in terms of water quality improvement? That really is triggered by the standards adopted by the state, which we are now under the CSO program really trying to achieve those fecal coliform targets, which is recently adopted. 200 CFE per 100 liter, milliliter. So its current thinking of the fecal criteria is kind of like the target that you want to reach to. So our long-term control plans are really keeping that in mind and trying to meet that target first seasonally when everybody is doing operational and then look at how much of that target we meet annually regardless of the seasonality. So that's our first thinking, the 200 fecal, the bacteria criteria that we would like to target by 2040. The second criteria, which is the most restrictive criteria, which we all talk about, the internal criteria. It's way more restrictive than the fecal criteria in terms of um, the, the bacteriological standards. You know, it, it causes more illnesses, you know, EPA is starting to encourage all the other coastal states to adopt the entire criteria, but we haven't really adopted that target yet, although we start incorporating that thinking into our long-term control plan right now. So, so that's the reason why when we say what is our target, first achieve today's condition people, and then go above to the max, maximum extent practical without hitting your bank account because everybody has a bank account and you know we talked about the rates and how much we can pay today versus 25 years from today. Maybe everybody is gonna be the top 1% eventually, which we hope, <laughs> and then we can pay anything we want. But we know today's condition is not gonna happen. So, so the next goal that we look without really breaking our bank account, how much of that future goal that we can do with our current um, system right now. So those are the two triggers for the CSO planning process that um, I think you know we want to keep that in mind as we go along, but when it comes to bacteria, bacteria criteria, it's the fecal first and eat up as much as enter as you can without breaking your bank, and then look at all the other parameters because you know, maybe Adam is gonna say, I don't care about bacteria, I care about nitrogen. Because I want to see what nitrogen is really going to end up doing for the algal blooms in the bay. So every other criteria is going to add on. But for the long-term control plan purposes, you know, which is the sanitary sewer mixing with the storm, we put the bacteria criteria first. And then we look at the dissolved oxygen. Because that's the second surrogate, we can really trigger the nitrogen reductions too is the second criteria. Anything you want to add? No. <laughs> um, any other questions? So in terms of next steps, we said earlier that the final long-term control plan will be submitted to the state at the end of June. Um, so we will be coming back to you in the spring to talk about the different alternatives that have been evaluated as part of the LTCP. So that toolbox of alternatives that Keith presented, we'll be looking at the options, again, for those tributaries that Lily highlighted as being the ones that are in the most need of help for water quality improvements. Um, between now and then, though, uh, there's lots of opportunities to engage with us. Um, if you have comments about this particular meeting, you can submit them uh, between now and October 31st. We've had a few comments here tonight about the meeting location, changing the location to somewhere else. We're happy to do that. Um, for those of you who represent particular groups where you weren't able to have a large turnout, we are happy to come out to you um, and talk about all of this information again because we know that um, Jamaica Bay is a waterway that a lot of people are very passionate about. Um, so much improvement has been done already, but as Pinar just uh, discussed, there's a lot of room to grow, and so we really want to get people on board. So again, we're happy to come out to you between now and the spring, and you can continue to submit comments uh, at our website 
Um, and on the next slide, we'll, oh, I have it, sorry. Um, the, today's presentation will be online by tomorrow. All of the poster boards that are up uh, will be online as well. Um, eventually, we'll have clips of the videos so that you can share that with your networks. Um, and again, we'll reconvene all together in spring to talk about those alternatives. Um, there'll be more opportunities to submit comments about the alternatives that are being proposed before we submit the final LTCP at the end of June. Um, so with that, we'll say again, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Please feel free to email us with any questions, and we will see you next time. Or next week at our MS4 meeting on Tuesday, that I feel like I should plug. Uh, we talked a lot about CSO today, but if you're interested in the MS4 program, we are meeting on Tuesday. Um, information about that is also available on our website. One meeting will be focused on one provision of our MS4 permit and the other will be a kickoff for our trash-free NYC Waters working group. So feel free to come out to that. We're going to have snacks at that one. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>